Hello and welcome back to the Rock of the Week, the love child of genealogy and calendars. Now this week I'm a bit nervous because I'm afraid this episode might fall a bit flat. I mean it's not because I'm not confident in my extensive knowledge of fancy compressed dirt, but because today's mineral is, well, flat. This week we're talking about biotite. It's a very unusual, flaky mineral with a lot of really cool and interesting properties. Biotite is one of the most important members of the mica family, which includes a lot of minerals that form these paper-like layered crystals. And it's also actually a family of itself of minerals that most of the time can't be really distinguished from each other. We'll get more into that later, but I think it goes without saying that the mica family of minerals has a lot of layers. The color of mica, or really any mineral, depends on what colors it absorbs and reflects. Here I have a piece of lapidolite, which is a type of mica known for containing a lot of lithium, but this color is actually caused by manganese, which absorbs all the colors except for pink. And here I have a piece of fuchsite, again another type of mica, which has a bit of a green, and this is caused by chromium. Now as you might have noticed, biotite is black, and it sometimes has a bit of a brown or gold to it, but unlike manganese and chromium, biotite contains iron and magnesium. And this basically absorbs all the light without reflecting any colors. Biotite, along with the other micas, are some of the only truly flexible minerals, which makes sense because of how thin the sheets are. You don't want to bend it too much though, because biotite is still pretty fragile. Oh, my desk is all covered. I'll be fun to vacuum. Biotite is pretty much everywhere, but usually in the form of tiny flakes of crystals inside rocks like this piece of granite, which I got from the countertop, and that's what makes it sparkle. Bigger crystals like this are less common, because although new biotite is always being formed, geological processes are constantly breaking it down and baking it into rocks like this. Here I have a piece of biotite that kind of shows a lot of those geological processes when compared to a piece of fresh biotite. You can see the flakes are a lot more compressed and a lot more solid. That doesn't mean big crystals like these are hard to come by though, and I'll talk more about how I got these later. But while more traditional crystals are possible like this one right here, biotite almost always starts forming as these layered masses of crystals, which sometimes have a hexagonal shape like this one, uh, and these often get called books, which I honestly find pretty fitting. Son, your brother and I have decided that you need to take a break from your screens. We're going up north this weekend, and the only entertainment you can bring is books. Oh, man. So like I said, biotite is incredibly common, and you can find it pretty much anywhere. In fact, it's estimated that around 7% of the Earth's crust is made of biotite. A lot of the pieces I have here I collected in Bancroft, Ontario, and a lot of similar stuff can actually be found in Sudbury, Ontario, as well as a lot of locations along the east coast of the US, like Virginia and New England. Biotite also sometimes appears in lava, like the stuff that comes out of Mount Vesuvius in Italy, and also the western Dolomites contain a lot of volcanic rock, which was made from this biotite-rich lava which cooled off over time. Biotite crystals can get absolutely massive, the biggest one measuring about 7 meters across, which was found in Eveland, Norway. This one I have here was found in Bancroft, Ontario, and it measures about 10 inches across. So like I said, traditional crystals are possible, like this one found in Wannenkopf, Germany. I'm sorry if I offended anyone with that pronunciation. But these crystals are rare, and that leads us into our next section, structure. So I'm sure everyone's familiar with these flat crystals by now, but deep down, biotite isn't actually flat. But before that, we need to talk about the formula. Now, biotite, like I said, is a very complicated family of minerals, and that's why you'll see a lot of commas. Biotite always contains potassium, then either some iron or magnesium, some aluminum silicate, and then either some fluorine or hydroxide to balance everything out. The bonds between these atoms are generally pretty weak, and that's why biotite is so fragile. Now, biotite is a silicate, specifically a phyllosilicate, which includes all the mica minerals along with things like talc. And that happens when these silicon tetrahedrons, which we talked about in the last episode, form these big lattices of hexagonal sheets like this, along with whatever elements are included. As you might have guessed, that is why biotite forms in sheets. Now you see, biotite is actually a bit of an imposter. This seemingly hexagonal crystal actually has a bit of a slant to it, which doesn't usually happen with hexagonal crystals. Biotite is actually part of the monoclinic crystal system. All these elements that make up biotite form into these crystal units, which are a bit of an irregular rhombus shape. 
I have an example here that isn't actually biotite, it's muscovite, but they're pretty closely related. And you can see that the growth lines have these sort of rhombus shapes in them. But the really cool part is that if we get one of these hexagons and overlay it, you can see that's almost a perfect match. So basically the reason why biotite forms in hexagons is because the individual rhombuses it's made of basically come together and form hexagonal shapes. Now that was more than enough chemistry for one week. Let's talk about cleavage. So biotite has a perfect basal cleavage or perfect cleavage in one way. And that basically describes how it splits into sheets in one direction. These sheets are pretty soft, measuring around a 2.5 to a 3 on the most scale, whereas fingernails are around a 2.5. That means that the softer ones can be scratched easily by a fingernail, but the harder ones like this one I showed earlier is going to be a bit more tricky. Biotite is also pretty lightweight, measuring around a 3 in specific gravity, and that means that it has about 3 times the weight of a quantity of water the same shape and size. Biotite is actually the sparkle you see in a lot of glitter and makeup products, but that's usually things like muscovite, because biotite is a bit too dark. Biotite is, however, sometimes added to soil, and because of how flaky it is, water and nutrients often get trapped between these flakes and make it easier for the plant to absorb them. And finally, since biotite contains potassium, it's sometimes used in rock dating. You rock my world. No, not that kind of dating, I mean determining the age of a rock. Sometimes, biotite along with other potassium-rich micas and feldspars contain a radioactive form of potassium, called K40. This type of potassium decays into argon gas, which, when the rock is molten, usually just leaves into the atmosphere. But when the rock solidifies, it gets trapped within the rock and over time builds up. By determining how much argon gas is in, say, a piece of biotite, you can get a lot of insight on the age, purity, and composition of the rock it was found around. Alright, as cool as I think rock dating is, I think it's time we get to some fun facts. Biotite was named in 1847 after Jean-Baptiste Biot. He was a mineralogist, mathematician, physicist, meteoricist, astronomer, and believe it or not, French. Although he spent a lot of his life examining how light would interact with micas in different ways, he was actually one of the guys who discovered that running electricity through a wire created a magnetic field. Back in the days of the gold rush, inexperienced panners would come across little shiny golden flakes of biotite. As you might expect, they'd go nuts over this, thinking they'd found gold. Now gold is actually over six times heavier than biotite, so they would have found out pretty quickly. Anyway, that's all I have time for today. I really hope you enjoyed and maybe learned something new. Let me know in the comments what you think, and I will see you all next week. Happy collecting, everyone. No. Just, just, like I said, just don't worry about it.